the british are trying to expand in bengal the british are in control in bengal in 1757 there is a battle of plassey that happened the british put up their puppet ruler mir jafar now mir jafar uh, is a puppet ruler of bengal but since it is the british who have successfully made him win you will find that the british are now extracting concessions out of mir jafar so they ask him that uh, we should have preferential trade the british gain control of the entire uh, area of bengal so you will find that uh, they are trying to nars they are trying to coerce the traders to sell them cheap because as i told you the british were essentially there for finished products and in those finished products you will find that uh, uh, if the indian artisans themselves sold you cheap and you go to britain and you can uh, you know uh, sell them at a very higher price you can gain maximum profit so you will find that uh, uh, there is an entire uh, looting that goes on in bengal and uh, that is why you will find that uh, this entire mir jafar episode is turning out to be a disaster so mir jafar now begins to slowly slowly uh, resent the british and that's why the british in between uh, replace mir jafar with a ruler called mir qasim so mir qasim is now the nawab of bengal of course a nominal nawab of bengal he is not definitely in control of bengal uh, you will find that uh, under mir qasim also the british start to loot uh, we will uh, uh, mir qasim will again now try to get work hold over bengal uh, area and try to curtail the british so the third point is that you will find that there are custom duties that he tries to impose on the british also the british were allowed lesser custom duties and the indian traders were allowed higher custom duties just to favor the british so he ensures that more custom duties are levied on the british and he realizes that uh, if he is in power with the control of the british it is impossible for him to uh, uh, rule bengal continue ruling bengal if he really uh, 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 takes the control uh, if he really rules in favor with the british so uh, you will find that you will find that uh, mir qasim is now uh, trying to ensure that the british are being kept at bay so what he does now is that he tries to uh, have secret alliances now in those times who are the indian kingdoms with whom he can have some secret alliance with find that uh, so uh, shuja ud daula now becomes an ally of uh, mir qasim similarly uh, the mughal emperor in delhi now till all these days the mughal emperor was just a nominal head he was absolutely like he was had no power but in 1761 the marathas defeated the uh, uh, marathas were defeated by ahmed shah abdali in the battle of panipat 1761 so the rule of marathas slowly slowly uh, uh, had rescinded or reduced when it comes to uh, yes i'll try to use earphones if there's if they if they're available i'll just ask uh, you will find that uh, the, the rule of the marathas had uh, reduced on delhi and uh, naturally the marathas were in no position to support any indian power so mir qasim now allies with shuja ud daula of awadh and uh, emperor shah alam the second of delhi he is the mughal emperor and together they plot uh, a military expedition against the british to throw them out of uh, uh, bengal so what happened was that the battle in which they fought it is called as the battle of baksar baksar is in bihar Uh, you will find that on 22nd of october 1764 both the armies met the armies met there and there was a proper fight now see in 1757 the british had won through intrigues there was no real military fight but now in 1764 there is a proper military fight you will find that the british are actually fighting uh, indian powers and three indian powers allied the nawab of bengal the uh, nawab of awadh shuja ud daula and whatever paltry mughal forces existed uh, that is the uh, 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 the mughal emperor so you will find that on 22nd of october 1764 for the first time in the entire british entry into india the british have conclusively won against indian powers the british won the battle of baksar the nawab of bengal mir qasim was defeated and naturally this was one of the greatest victory that the british had because if uh, you remember i told you jadunath sarkar had said that battle of plassey 1757 is the start of uh, uh, start of this entire uh, modern age in india but uh, it is really the battle of baksar where you will find that uh, 
real victory of british is uh, there so now british for now are in complete control of bengal so what do the british do now after if they are victors naturally they will try to have some terms and conditions which are favorable to them just a second you will find that the british actions uh, are uh, of course were going to be they will try to forge some terms and conditions which are in their favor so what they did was the first thing that they did was mm-hmm. that uh, the british are uh, uh, they defeated the mughals so the first thing that they did was they secured uh, the revenue rights or the nizamat rights from the mughal emperor of bengal mind you nawab of bengal was independent but still the mughal emperor was the titular head of india so he, the british on paper secured revenue rights from bengal because why were the british here they were here for money essentially they were here for money so you will find that the british uh, if they secure revenue rights from bengal they can go to the villages and collect land revenue from the farmers so apart from trading the finished products in india now the british have got a second source of income which is essentially the uh, uh, the revenue extraction from the farmers so now the british are in complete control of bengal what did they do, do to awadh because shuja ud daula of awadh was also defeated so they extracted heavy uh, war indemnity so is in the british wanted money in return because we have defeated you so if you want to retain your kingdom just give a lot of money to us so the east india company secured a lot of money from awadh kingdom and mm-hmm. the awadh kingdom was still allowed to exist why see the strategic thinking of the british the strategic thinking of the british is that now they want the strategic thinking of the british is that now they want so uh, you will find that uh, awadh was kept kingdom it was not annexed by the british why because they wanted to create awadh as a buffer state buffer state means that now awadh is a protectorate of the british but the kingdom is independent so that at least there exists some kingdom to be a protection against the marathas mind you the marathas were ruling throughout the country if awadh also was annexed by the british it was a direct challenge to maratha supremacy because just to the west of awadh you had the gwalior the sindhias were sitting there in gwalior so just to ensure that the maratha buffer state exists uh, 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 as a as a counter to the marathas you will find that the uh, british ensured that awadh kingdom should stay now so they did uh, they uh, had uh, they extracted revenue rights from the mughal emperor shah alam the second he was pensioned off as a uh, as british prisoner in alabad they kept awadh kingdom as it is but extracted huge money and now finally coming to bengal you will find that uh, in bengal you will find that the british now defeated mir qasim and in replacement of him they set up a new nawab called as nizam uddaula so the nawab of new, new uh, nawab of bengal is nizam uddaula what does nizam uddaula do he has absolutely no powers earlier mir jafar and mir qasim had some powers now mir uh, nizam uddaula has absolutely no power what the british set up is something totally different they set up something called as a dual government of 1765 to 1772 uh, it was robert clive's brain child i told you robert clive was the head of the east india company then in india so you will find that uh, robert clive uh, Uh, uh essentially now wants to take hold of the government in bengal but he cannot take it directly so the second point that i mentioned is that rationale behind dual control so why dual control what happened is that the british were less in number i told you british were hardly few hundreds or few thousands max there were crores of people living in bengal so if you suddenly change the government and british mm-hmm. are ultimately foreigners so if uh, they are foreigners and they want uh, any kind of uh, new rule to be set up there will be resistance from the common people so there was no point in totally taking over the administration the second reason was that irrespective uh, that irrespective of uh, even if the british were large or small in number they were aliens to bengal so naturally they had no relation to bengal they did not understand bengali language they did not understand the local culture so if they totally took over the administration it would have been very very difficult for them to run the administration so now what the british decided was that rather than totally taking hold of bengal let's set up a dual government so let's have a nawab a nominal nawab who is there who is uh, ruling on behalf of the people which is nizam uddaula but the real control now rests with the british so they appoint a kind of a Uh, uh, a kind of a post called as deputy subedar or deputy diwan diwan is a person who collects money subedar is the control of the military 
so deputy subedar and deputy diwan these are the two posts that they appoint most of the times uh, the person was only one only one person was the deputy subedar as well as the deputy diwan that guy was technically reporting to the nawab technically you know all for just technical purposes in reality he was uh, appointed by the british and he functioned uh, according to the british whims and fantasies his entire policies were designed based on what the Rob british british and especially robert clive wanted so what did the british start they started to loot the zamindars because they wanted revenue there were zamindars in between who used to collect the revenue so they started to loot the zamindars they looted the farmers they had a, they made sure that indian trade which is the bengali people who were trading with the foreign nations was totally mm -hmm. stopped and it is totally the british who will take control of the trade they forced the artisans to sell their goods finished products textiles especially cheaper to the british so if i procure say a textile for 10 rupees uh, in uh, bengal and i sell it for 5000 rupees in britain whose profit is it it is east india company's profit so there is complete loot that is going on in in bengal during this time of dual government 1765 to 1772 so you will find that uh, the british have all power but no responsibility and nawab has all responsibility but no power so it was a horrible condition and naturally when there is not a single ruler who rules in bengal and there are multiple power centers what comes out of it is anarchy so what was the result of all of this you will find that a law and order terribly collapsed in bengal because nawab soldiers were not there the clive it is said that robert clive alone made a fortune of 2 million euros how big is it 2 million sterling i'm sorry 2 million sterling for his own personal gains and the gains for east india company are different than that so imagine the kind of loot so uh, some historian actually used the word correctly that they bled bengal white so actually they sucked out so much of blood that bengal was white and pale now it was that kind of a loot there was complete collapse of artisanry and trade because if you are an artisan if you are taking cotton as a raw material and weaving it into a finished textile you require some money you require patronage there should be some profit for you right there has to be some money that you should gain out of all of this the artisanry simply couldn't do that and the entire trade collapsed you will find that uh, bengal was totally under ruin so what happened was the impact was that once the people are derided of their money derided of their livelihoods there is no law and order if in all of this if even in one time if the rains fail or some problem in food goes on the end result is a famine so of all the multiple famines that india faced during the british time the first major famine mm -hmm. that was there during the british times was the bengal famine of 1769 70 it is said that one third population of bengal was wiped off it is that deadly famine it was terrible famine and the british were solely responsible it was a man made famine and the british were solely responsible for this destruction of human life and you, the people of bengal were totally made they were impoverished and you will find that finally the british government there in england also woke up of this now they realized that something is not right if such a great famine is happening that means east india company is not ruling properly they also realized that east india company is looting the people so what they tried to do was that the entire regulating act of 1767 was passed so just see the name regulation so you will find that the british are trying to regulate people so you will find that uh, uh, the british government passes a regulating act of 1767 in this regulating act of 1767 the british now compulsorily make the people uh, the east india company to pay 4 lakh sterling per year to the british government because the british government realized that these people are gaining a lot of profits so they should be regulated so the east india company should pay 4 lakh sterling to the british government annually that is the first regulating act of 1767 so if you see that the entire dual government structure is such that it is simply creating a lot of problems for bengal the only entity to profit out of all of this was east india company and nobody else so you will find that east india company was under lot of pressure so be as it may the dual government got over in 1772 that was the time when robert, robert clive was brought back and a new uh, head of the east india company was uh, uh, sent to india his name was warren hastings so what we will now be seeing is in the second half of 19th century 18th century uh, this is the brief timeline that i have brought to you 
so i told you till 1772 there was this dual government which was simply looting the people from 1772 to 1785 you had warren hastings uh, warren hastings uh, uh, is the one who actually started the annexation process in india and he was the one who fought wars with many big big kingdoms from 1786 to 1793 you had lord cornwallis uh, you can note down this timeline so that this will be important uh, under lord cornwallis uh, you will have uh, the permanent settlement being passed so uh, we will come to that the revenue settlements what they have passed they are in the next lectures uh, in from 1793 to 98 this was a not a consequential uh, governor uh, sir john shore you can forget it the main things that happened what happened during the rule of lord wellesley so from 1798 to 1805 you had lord wellesley trying to gain the british control over india and from 1813 to 1823 you had lord hastings uh, i am saying that because uh, that was the time for the third anglo maratha war it was lord hastings who was the governor of in, uh, governor general of india so this is the brief timeline so we have seen till 1772 robert clive had the dual government and he was withdrawn and warren hastings has been sent to india so now let us see what this guy warren hastings wrecked havoc in india so this is the photo of warren hastings एकदम गोड गोड आणि गोंडस फोटो या माणसाचा पण तसलं काही नाही आहे ते हिंदी क्राईम पेट्रोलमध्ये म्हणतात ना इस भोलीसी सुरत पे मत जाईये सुरत की पिछे एक दरिंदा छपा हुआ आहे दॅट काइंड ऑफ स्टफ इज देअर इवन दो ही लुक्स व्हेरी इनसेंट दिस गाय इज द वन रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द इकॉनॉमिक रुईन ऑफ इंडिया ॲज वेल एज ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी बोथ सो टील नाव ॲटलिस्ट द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी हॅड मनी नाव इवन ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी विल नॉट हॅव मनी वेन वॉर एनिस्टिंग स्टार्ट्स रुलिंग the main reason being the war that this person is trying to heap so you will see that the war of warren hastings with mysore with marathas and all these stuffs now begin okay so the actions taken by warren hastings this is what we are mainly going to see so before going to the wars that were fought by warren hastings we let's see what kind of actions that he took where he tried to regulate the affairs of the east india company i have classified them into four administrative actions he abolished the dual government so he said that uh, uh, no there is a comment which said was warren hastings and lord hastings the same no warren hastings ruled from 1772 to 1785 lord hastings was the governor general from 1813 to 1823 these are two different people okay so warren hastings warren hastings essentially abolished the dual government so he said that enough is enough in bengal we don't want any nawab wabab etc now we are going to directly take control of bengal so the british officially east india company officially annexed bengal now it is the ruler of bengal and that's why he decided that since we are the rulers now we will collect the revenue so the concept of collectors uh, even today we say that a district has a collector so the meaning of that collector is a person who collects revenue that's why the british started this position as a collector so european officers were now appointed as collectors in various parts of bengal to collect revenue on behalf of the british now Uh, the revenue systems that he was brought i told you till 1772 it was absolute random way of collecting revenue there was no fixed revenue the british came they pressurized the uh, people to uh, uh, give them revenues bribes any extra payment everything there was nothing fixed so what happened was warren hastings on his side tried to set up a new system of revenue collection it is called as the izardari settlement now izardari settlement is not new izardari settlement existed even in uh, mughal times what is izardari settlement it is called revenue farming as in i will denote a kind of a land block maybe a district or a sub region and i will put that up for sale that anybody who wishes to become the revenue collector for this region uh, should apply and he will be selected and he will be asked to uh, collect revenue on the behalf of british so this izardari settlement for 5 years was set up by uh, lord hastings and uh, it actually had indians in it also Uh, so they, this was the attempt on warren hastings side to essentially try to control the revenue that it could guarantee that it could gain from india that's a different story that the revenue still did not stabilize because already bengal was ruined on judicial front warren hastings tried to do something totally different what he tried to do was he now set up some ruling courts for indians because now the british are in control of bengal earlier maybe uh, the nawab's court itself decided on the judicial matters now the british had to decide on judicial matters so they had to set up some courts so even today we this terminology is used because that was a mughal terminology diwani and fauzdari adalat so diwani cases will deal with the civil issues and fauzdari uh, courts will deal with criminal issues so diwani and fauzdari adalats were reestablished by 
foreign hastings in most parts of bengal and uh, what were the laws through which they would govern he decided that uh, uh, it was the hindu and muslim personal laws so when we'll come to the system of orientalism you will realize that warren hastings was an orientalist he felt that indians should be governed with the help of indian laws and customs so the hindu personal laws what are basically called as the uh, uh, the i'm sorry if i'm forgetting the name the uh, mitakshar and uh, mitakshar is one and dayabhag dayabhag and mitakshar these are the two in, uh, hindu personal laws and muslim personal law is the sharia so dayabhag and mitakshar is the uh, law which governed the hindus and shariat is the is governed by uh, was used to govern the muslims so the courts gave decisions based on these two laws and this kind of a judicial structure was set up by lord hastings you will find that uh, the commercial structure was also try, somehow he tried to regulate it he uh, had a uniform custom duty for british as well as the indian traders uh, he ensured that the dastaks are not misused remember in the last lecture i told you about the dastaks dastaks are essentially those uh, documents that are given to traders so that they are not charged revenue they are not charged custom duties so they can pay a fixed sum to the british or to the government in bengal and in return they will get dastak so that they are not harassed for revenue i told you these dastaks were misused by many people and uh, these dastaks were copied and fraudulently given to many traders leading to loss of revenue for uh, the bengal government so he prevented the misuse of dastaks just to regulate the trade so by reading all of this you might feel that are warren hastings to itna bura nahi tha aadmi he tried to regulate some of us the problem is that warren hastings uh started a lot of wars in india he started to fight with mysore he started to fight with marathas and war needs money and where will he extract the money from he'll extract the money from bengal so this entire process led to a more and more economic exploitation and at the end the east india company actually did not win any war money was spent but no war was won so it ultimately even led to financial troubles for east india company so now what happened was that once the british government also realized that even if we have sent warren hastings now to prevent another robert clive like dual government in india the british east india company needs to be regulated so you will learn this in your polity lessons also when you will learn constitution and how indian constitution evolved you will find that the first act that you are asked to study is the regulating act of 1773 so you will hear regulating act of 1773 its india act of 1784 Uh, you will have the takeover of the british uh, government in 1858 indian council act of 1861 and 1892 the government of india act 1909 1919 and 1935 these are the acts that you will generally listen to or read about in your polity so we will be covering these acts also but from a historical perspective there is some history attached to it. there has to be some context to it as to why these laws were passed so first we will start uh, with the regulating act of 1773 So now the British had earlier passed a regulating act, but that was in 1767. They only had asked the British uh, East India Company to pay four lakh sterling per year. But merely making them pay money is not going to regulate their affairs in India. You had to actually ensure that the governance reforms were. So what uh, happened was that in Britain, I told you in 1689, Britain had transformed into a constitutional monarchy. There was a House of Lords and House of Commons. Elections used to take place, and a proper, democratically elected government used to be there in England. So there was the government of Lord North. He was the Prime Minister of uh, England, and he initiated the constitutional process of what exactly needs to be done to regulate the affairs of East India Company. So the entire committee submitted its report, and the law that was passed was the Regulating Act of 1773. So now the reason behind the entire thing, why the constitutional process was there, because I have listed all the reasons on your screen that the British Crown could not let East India Company create another empire within an empire. So what if tomorrow East India Company goes rogue and says that we will not align with Britain and this is now our independent position? So that was a threat. So you need to regulate the East India Company. The most important part was there were three presidencies of British at that point of time: Bombay, Madras, and Bengal. all were in their small own limited areas there was no land connection between the two in between there were the mighty marathas and you had to have connection between the three presidencies only via sea communication no telegraph no railways nothing so it was all problematic to govern the affairs the bombay presidency used to take decisions on its behalf bengal used to take on its behalf and there was no coordination so there has to be some centralized structure in india itself where decision making for the three presidencies should be same 
you will find that dual government was also problematic so they found that uh, the entire uh, 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 the entire uh, structure of the dual government had to be properly uh, formulated uh, you will find that uh, the uh, actual people of east india company were also gaining a lot of profits i told you robert clive he earned 2 million dollars 2 million sterlings as his profit and they these people essentially looted india so they could not ha- allow the east india company to simply uh, govern india the way it wanted so you will find that uh, the regulating act of 1773 needed to be passed so what were the exact provisions of the act the most important provision was centralization of administration so the B- governor general of bengal was now governor general of all the three provinces so you will have the bengal governor general that is warren hastings taking control of all the three provinces that is Beng- uh, B- bombay and madras as well as bengal so there was centralization but to prevent uh, warren hastings from becoming too powerful they decided that a legislative council should be there for uh, this guy warren hastings so there are, there was a council set up with four members and the decisions that this council used to take there were five members essentially warren hastings and plus four the decisions will be taken by majority so to ensure that warren hastings does not uh, uh, give his entire uh, uh, rulings based on his own whims and fantasies you wanted a council so that it could take decisions by majority uh, you will find that the governor general was put under parliamentary control it basically meant that the parliamentary control Uh, uh as in the east india company had to uh, give its accounts that is where to, how is it gaining money where is it spending money all this account had to be placed before the british parliament for auditing so this will also regulate the affairs of the east india company and uh, the another part is that a supreme court was established in calcutta so uh, a kind of a judicial process was uh, was uh, started to be established in uh, bengal so you will find that Uh, uh, a supreme court was established in calcutta you will find that the supreme court's main provision was to only govern the british aspect british british citizens so this was not for indian citizens it was only for british citizens so the british citizens could be governed by the british law and even other europeans so a supreme court was established to ensure that the con- the uh, the habits of the english people living in calcutta are also kept under control uh, and the most important part to just to prevent corruption that no military or civil officer will accept any gift from anybody so you will find that the entire uh, 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 provisions of regulating act 1773 were meant to regulate or control the affairs of the east india company but this act was going to be proven to be a big failure why were the drawbacks were the drawbacks of the east india companies uh, regulating act 1773 i'm decision making because no decision could be taken there were frequent fights warren hastings always used to fight with his his council members and there was no decision making that could happen in all of these cases so it was a big problem the second drawback was yes you had supreme court in calcutta but what was its jurisdiction Uh, what was its relation with governor general can supreme court issue directions to governor general can governor general control the supreme court what was the exact structure nobody knew because there was no separation of power concept then so you really did not know how the supreme court of calcutta used to function you will find that uh, the, the jurisdiction of the supreme court was not clear should anglo indian that is british who had married indian people and uh, you will find that uh, 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 what 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 the anglo indians that were born were they british citizens or indian citizens was supreme court uh, having jurisdiction on them or not total confusion so this entire centralization process and giving more power to warren hastings but yet again he had no power because there was he was at the mercy of his council so you will find that uh, this was all you know a big big issue and the entire regulating act of 1773 proved to be a big big failure so uh, uh, this act was later on renewed in 1784 it's called the pitts india act we'll come to them but now essentially we are in the ruling time of warren hastings i told you the various mm-hmm. decisions that he took but those decisions proved to be a big failure and he simply indulged himself in wars which wars now we will start with the actual things you will find these questions many times come in your uh, gs as well as optional papers the anglo maratha war 
so now you have uh, the marathas uh, if you look at the history of marathas marathas uh, uh, essentially uh, would suffered a huge defeat in 1761 in the battle of panipat they, they their control over north india was totally devastated uh, only the sindhes remained strong around gwalior but that was also very very feeble uh, back in pune where the peshwa was there you have a, a young Pesh- uh, madhara peshwa being actually there but madhara peshwa was Uh, he died quite early because of disease but by the time he died in 1772 the marathas had gained a lot of control over territories in north india after madhara peshwa died you have uh, the the most obvious uh, person to take over the throne was narayan rao but he was killed by his own uncle raghunath rao so the famous kaka mala vatswa thing that we say it was narayan rao who was killed by raghunath rao in 1773 and the entire uh, family fight started in the peshwa kingdom so raghunath rao was essentially thrown out of the uh, kingdom and he was not allowed to meddle in the peshwa affairs in the place of now narayan rao a young peshwa madhav rao the second becomes the peshwa he was very very small and now the most important character of maratha history that is nana fadnis comes up he tries to control the affairs of uh, the maratha kingdom through uh, madhav rao the second who was just the nominal ruler but the real war and peace was done by nana fadnis so from 1774 to 1795 you had the time of nana fadnis uh, skillfully doing all the diplomacy and keeping the british off their tracks so but i told you problems always existed raghunath peshwa was told, was told to go out of the peshwa kingdom raghunath peshwa allied with the british with the hope that if the british could exert some pressure on the marathas raghunath rao could be made a peshwa so raghunath rao now allies with the british and he tries to uh, try to uh, to force the british to somehow attack the marathas so now starts the time of skirmishes so uh, when it comes to skirmishes you will find that the first skirmish happened in 1775 around that uh, and there was a treaty of surat that raghunath rao tried to have with the british which made essentially raghunath rao the new peshwa uh, you will find that uh, 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 the british essentially rejected any kind of peace with raghunath rao the council essentially i told you warren hastings had a council the council simply rejected warren hastings trying to deal anything with peshwa uh, but now the british themselves were quite wary of uh, uh, the the marathas because they were the largest power so the first uh, skirmish uh, uh, that actually took place was uh, in 1779 when there was a battle of wadgaon the british actually sent troops there was a battle at wadgaon and the british were conclusively defeated and it was a humiliating treaty that they had to sign and you know the british realized that they are not in no position to uh, be under control of the marathas so this photo that i brought this is essentially a painting the person sitting on the throne is madhara the second uh, he is a young very young people person and to the right of him is nana fadnis he is actually trying to deal with all the affairs of the maratha empire okay so i told you there was a battle at wadgaon the british themselves were quite wary and uh, they simply could not win uh, against the marathas so now warren hastings actually officially tried to declare a war against the marathas how did he do that uh, you will find that warren hastings now orders his captain to directly start attacking the territories of sindhias so rather than attacking core territories in maharashtra where the marathas were strong the british now tried to attack the peripheral regions of the maratha empire so you will find that uh, it is the uh, territories in yamuna valley which were under control of the sindhias of gwalior those began to be attacked by the uh, british so warren hastings ordered it so that in 1782 where a major war broke out that is called as the first anglo maratha war you will find that the british actually fought with the sindhias and this war ultimately led to defeat of the british but now the war had to be stopped because even sindhias were under no position to continue this war so the british stopped the first anglo maratha war in 1782 and signed a treaty the treaty's name is the treaty of salbay or treaty of salbay depending upon what spelling you make the treaty of salbay 1782 was signed by the marathas uh, you will find that uh, uh, anglo maratha war uh, essentially benefited nobody and the marathas were very strong militarily but they almost used to get screw themselves up in diplomacy so if you see the treaty of salbay you will realize why i'm saying that so if i look at the provisions of the treaty of salbay discussing provisions 
Madhavrao II. Some benefits to the Marathas were that Madhavrao II, that is the small ruler of Peshwa, he was accepted as Peshwa. You have Fateh Singh Gaekwad accepted as the ruler of Baroda. So all the successors to the Maratha states were accepted by the British, and they will not mingle in any succession battles. Uh, all the Maratha territories that were conquered by the British in the Yamuna Valley were given back to the Sindhyas, except for Salbe and Salset. Salset is in Bombay, and uh, Salbai region in Yamuna Valley. Only those regions were kept by the British. But the most problematic thing that the Marathas ended up signing in the Treaty of Salbe was that the Marathas accepted that for 20 years there will be no war between the British and the Marathas. That the Marathas will not. Have any kind of military pursuit against the British, and so the British will also not do. So there was 20 years of peace between the Marathas and the British. It's a big problem because if the major kingdom is not fighting a war with you, this leaves British the freedom to tackle with the smaller kingdoms. So you will have uh, uh, Mysore, Nizam, Awad. All these smaller kingdoms are now free for British conquests because the Marathas simply are not going to tackle anything of that sort. And in return, the Peshwas also promised the British that they will support any British aggression on Mysore if so be the case. So you will find that the Marathas, by these two provisions itself, essentially lost the game there and there itself. Because had the Marathas decided that enough is enough, uh, the Britishers are outsiders and now we are going to kick them out, nobody could have stopped them. Already the British were in dangerous financial condition because they were war with Mysore. This was the first Anglo-Maratha war with Marathas. and they had simply lost their money you will also find that their izaradari settlement was not working so their revenues were stretched already in this point of time the american war of independence had started remember 1776 is when america declared its first declaration of independence so american war of independence uh, started and america was liberated in 1781 so you will find that already east india company was under a lot of pressure and in that now you are you know uh, fighting wars with maratha so it was a horrible problem for warren hastings So what the British essentially got out of this was peace with the Marathas, so that they could save themselves from financial distress. So you will find that somehow the British uh, ensured that this second, first Anglo-Maratha war ends with the Marathas getting something, but the British financial position was somehow saved from going totally bankrupt. So that is the biggest uh, plus point that the British got from all of this. So the end result of this. Uh, Uh, Treaty of Salbe was that the British East India Company went totally bankrupt. So I, I see I have written on the screen that the two Anglo-Mysore wars uh, were fought. We will get to them in the later part of the lecture. They did not yield any big result to the British. The first Anglo-Maratha war simply did not yield any result. Plus there were accusations of financial mismanagement uh, against uh, Warren Hastings, and the East India Company was indulging in too much wars beyond its capacity. So now there was necessity to stop that war there and there itself. so you will realize that the entire uh, war mechanism of east india company had to be regulated so after 1773 you have in 1784 the pits india act being promulgated so now the second major uh, prohibition or second major way of regulating the east india company's affairs in india was started it is called as the pits india act so east india company is that recalcitrant child No, simply not refusing to learn. 67 मरे act जाला, 73 मरे जाला, अता 84 मरे आला. So it's all a big problem every time. That every time the East India Company is behaving in some problematic manner, and now the British East India Company has to regulate this affair. So it's a big problem for them. What are the provisions of Pitt's India Act of 1784? The most important separation of duties. So one Governor General of East India Company. was in power to do with the was had the power to decide military matters as well as trade related matters they split it they said that now there will be a board of control uh, which may be headed by the governor general in india and some british parliamentarians in in england and they will deal with the military issues they will decide when to wage war when not to wage war so the control of waging war was taken away from east india company and the second body was the court of directors which will decide on the commercial issues so because East India Company was a trading company, so their main reason to be in India was to trade. So you will find that East India Company tried to split its affairs. The British government tried to split the affairs of East India Company into Board of Control and Court of Directors. So this mm -hmm. is dual control of the East India Company. 
this dual control continued till 1858 when east india company was finally abolished and the queen took over the rule in india so this is a long term provision that the british set up that this dual control will essentially regulate the war mongering attitude of the british east india company so it essentially virtually placed all the british east india company possessions under the british crown so it's an indirect way of the british parliament to tell the company that you may be capturing many territories in india but we are the real owners of it you are just a company but you are there on king's behalf you have a charter to trade with the uh, india and that's why whatever territories you conquer there we are the ones who are total rulers of it and not you so that's the essential message that the parliament of britain is giving it forbade wars temporarily for at least next 4 or 5 years you will find that british east india company had no big major wars and it also had the base for permanent settlement so the east uh, the government of britain realized that east india company is facing financial issues because it is not able to collect revenue properly from india so there has to be some permanent solution which has to be taken out to settle the revenue dues in india just to ensure how much revenue should be collected what should be the administrative setup for collection of that revenue everything has to be decided properly by the british parliament so they laid down the base for the permanent settlement of 1793 we will see that in the further lectures what exactly that settlement was but this pitts india act is a revolutionary act because it controlled and set the ball running for all the affairs in india till 1858 and the most important provision which i have i have actually forgot to mention here the most important provision here is that now henceforth for every 10 years the british east india company will get a charter renewing its privileges in india so you will find that henceforth there will be no absolute freedom to british east india company the british government after every 10 years will issue a charter to the british uh, east india company giving its rules and regulations and how it should rule india so the charter act of 1793 18 after every 20 years i'm sorry so 1793 1813 charter act of 1833 and charter act of 1853 these are the four charters that the british east india company got from the british parliament after every 20 years but as we will see in the future lectures all these charters essentially led to reduction of powers of east india company and finally in 1858 you will have east india company being abolished so pitts india act is a revolutionary act it essentially led many 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 things to ensure that uh, uh, the british uh, the east india company's affairs in india are regulated and the effect was this you will find that warren hastings was withdrawn from india in 1785 just one year after pitts india act and in his place it was lord cornwallis who was sent but the british parliament had did not have enough they said that there is some problem with warren hastings he had done lot of financial problems in india so they introduced an impeachment motion against warren hastings in british parliament so this is a pencil sketch of that impeachment motion so the british jury in the indian uh, british parliament sat on a judgment and they prosecuted warren hastings for financial misappropriation for essentially screwing up the finances of east india company and a lot of corruption so you will realize that this time of warren hastings 1772 to 1785 where he tried to have some administrative reforms in india but his war mongering attitude with mysore and marathas screwed up the entire finances of east india company he could not bring up a proper revenue settlement the izaradari settlement failed and that's why now there was a time to ensure that new things come up but we'll come to the economic aspects of british rule in the further lectures but for now we will say that the first anglo maratha war has been fought 1782 the treaty of salvai has been signed hence for next 20 years the marathas and the british did not fight so 1782 plus 20 is uh, uh, 1802 so till 1802 you will have very less activity on the british maratha front but as it turns out the marathas were on a self destruction mode why i call it self destruction mode is because now it is the internal fighting amongst the maratha kingdom that screwed their entire chances and let the british win so now we are proceeding towards the second anglo maratha war of 1802 exactly 20 years after the treaty of salvay okay so before doing that let me tell you uh, 
what is the subsidiary alliance now this is something which i forgot to mention i told you lord cornwallis came to india in 1785 he ruled till 1793 after that it was sir john shore who ruled till 1798 after 1798 till about 1805 you had lord wellesley being the governor general of india why this is important because this man finally decided that all the earlier governors whether it's warren hastings or beat robert clive they tried to not annex kingdoms directly they merely tried to create buffer states now uh, lord wellesley decides that we will now not just create buffer states but now we will actively interfere in the affairs of the states just to ensure that we get better control over these states so lord wellesley propounded something called as subsidiary alliance don't get intimidated by the words subsidiary what is meaning what do you mean by subsidiary subsidiary means to subsume manje majha hata khalcha mi ek company techa major parent company ji subsidiary ahe manje hata khalchi ahe so subsidiary cha artha hata khalcha so the british started to sign subsidiary alliance with indian kingdoms manje kay that the states with whom the subsidiary alliance was to be signed have to accept british paramountcy so the british are supreme and you as a kingdom are subsidiary to us hence it is called subsidiary alliance so you will find that the subsidiary alliance was propounded by the british if they defeated a kingdom in war they made that kingdom sign this subsidiary alliance so the first and the most important provision was that you had to accept british paramountcy what was the second provision you had to set up a british resident in your court see the british interference in sa darbar raja cha tithe tumcha ek british resident yun basna now that raja will do many decisions he will appoint people he will give important uh, uh, judicial uh, uh, judgments he will uh, decide on peace and war everything and the british resident is there in the court to listen to all of this so imagine the kind of interference that the british resident could make for example uh, when the peshwas later on signed the subsidiary alliance a british resident was actually put in uh, the peshwas court he could interfere with the peshwas all major activities सो अशा प्रकार एक ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट ठेवला जा थर्ड प्रोविजन इज दैट इन रिटर्न व्हाट विल दैट किंगडम गेट द किंगडम विल गेट दैट वी विल प्रोटेक्ट युअर किंगडम सो द किंग विल कंटिन्यू टू स्टे द किंग एंड नो अदर इंडियन किंगडम्स कैन अटैक दैट किंगडम एंड थ्रो अवे थ्रो दैट किंग अवे सो दैट किंग्स रॉयल पॉवर्स आर कंट्रोल्ड सो द किंग इसेन्शली फॉर हिज ओन पर्सनल सेल्फिशनेस ही साइन द सब्सिडरी अलायंस बिकॉज नाउ ही इज श्योर दैट ही विल रिमेन द किंग why because the british forces are going to protect the boundaries of that kingdom so just see he is ceding his security measures to the british so his own army is now disbanded and the british are now going to control the boundaries of this entire kingdom just see how risky it is tomorrow if the british say we will not protect you kya kar loge aap kuch nahi because your military is not existing so it is very risky so the british subsidiary forces will now protect the king and his kingdom but if you have an army you have to pay your soldiers you have to buy horses you have to buy swords it needs money so now the british are extracting money from the kingdom itself that the kingdom should pay the british army for protecting itself if you are not in a position to pay give some territory of yours to the british so that the british will collect revenue from that territory and utilize it for maintenance of the army so just see how how karun kashe conditions padat jata hai pehle fakt paramount se मो मंडार रेसिडेंट्स पाजे मो मंडार आम आर्मी तुम्हारा प्रोटेक्ट करना मैं आर्मी सा तुम्हें पैसे पैया न से जमीन दया सग आम दया वन मोर कंडीशन यू आर नॉट अलाउड टू स्यू फॉर पीस और वॉर और एनी डिप्लोमसी विथ एनी अदर इंडियन किंगडम विदाउट ब्रिटिश परमिशन सो सपोजेडली द निजाम हैड टू टॉक से विद द पेशवा ही वॉज नॉट अलाउड इफ द निजाम हैड साइन सब्सिडरी अलायंस ही हैड टू टेक ब्रिटिश परमिशन टू टॉक टू एनी अदर इंडियन किंगडम सो दिस इज टू प्रिवेट Indian kingdoms from negotiating with each other and collectively fighting against the British. So, Bharatiya ekatran no ko yella. Manun subsidiary alliance prevented them from talking to any other Indian kingdom, and in return, the British promised them to protect their kingdom from an external attack. And one more point that I missed was that the British asked the kingdom not to deal with any other European power. Lakshad gya. French 1760 mother defeat zale hote. Correct. बट इन द लेट सेवीन नाइनटीज फ्रेंच रेवल्यूशन होता सेवीन एटी नाइन 
त्यानंतर फ्रान्समध्ये सेव्हन्टीन एटी सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टीज नंतर नेपोलियन आला नेपोलियन वॉज स्प्रेडिंग इज एम्पायर इन युरोप अँड ही वॉज ॲक्टिव्हली ट्राईंग टू फाईट अगेन्स्ट ब्रिटन सो द फ्रेंच पीपल वर लुकिंग फॉर अ री एंट्री इन टू इंडिया सो फ्रेंच पीपल वर निगोशिएटिंग विथ इंडियन किंगडम्स फ्रेंच पीपल वर निगोशिएटिंग विथ पेशवाज हाऊ कॅन दे फाईट अगेन्स्ट द ब्रिटिश सो दिस मेड ब्रिटिश नर्वस सो सबसिडिअरी अलायन्स इन लेट सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टीज मेड द इंडियन किंगडम्स ॲक्सेप्ट दॅट दे विल नॉट डील विथ एनी अदर युरोपियन पॉवर सो अशा प्रकारचा सबसिडिअरी अलायन्स केम अप इन लेट सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टीज अँड द ब्रिटिश फॉर हुसो एव्हर विथ द हुसो एव्हर वन हुसो एव्हर वॉज लो लॉस इन फ्रंट ऑफ द ब्रिटिश वेदर इट इज द मराठाज और निजाम और अवध दे वर फोर्स टू ॲक्सेप्ट दिस कंडिशन्स सो दिस इज लॉर्ड वेलेसली ही वॉज अ मिलिटरी कमांडर नॅचरली यू कॅन सी इट फ्रॉम हिस फेस आय डोंट नो वाय हीज कॅरिंग अ कॉन्स्टिपेटेड फेस बट या दॅट इज द जनरल फीचर ऑफ ऑल द ब्रिटिश पीपल ऑल देअर फोटोज आर कॉन्स्टिपेटेड फेसेस बट वॉट वॉज द इम्पॅक्ट ऑफ दिस सबसिडरी अलायन्स लॉर्ड वेलेसले हिमसेल्फ टोल्ड इट इन अ मिनिट ऑर इन अ स्पीच इन एटीन झिरो फोर लॉर्ड वेलेसले हिमसेल्फ सेड दॅट सबसिडरी अलायन्स इज अ वे टू फॅटन अलाईज जस्ट लाईक वी फॅटन पिग्स बिफोर स्लॉटर सो साध्या मराठीत बोलायचं तर बोकडाला जेव्हा कापायचं असतं त्याच्या आधी बोकडाला भरपूर खाऊ घातलं जातं सो इसेन्शली लॉर्ड वेलेसले ट्राय टू प्रोटेक्ट इंडियन किंगडम्स ट्राय टू ब्रिंग दोज इंडियन किंगडम्स ऑन द ब्रिटिश साईड सो दॅट समटाईम इन द फ्युचर यू कॅन सिम्पली अनेक्स दोज किंगडम्स सो दॅट इज इसेन्शली द गेम ऑफ सबसिडरी अलायन्स सबसिडरी अलायन्स इज द बेस फॉर ब्रिटिश अनेक्सेशन इन इंडिया अजूनही त्यांनी अनेक्स नाही केलं अजूनही ब्रिटिश म्हणतात की तो राजाच रूल करणार सबसिडरी अलायन्समध्ये ब्रिटिश अजूनही बॅकग्राऊंडलाच आहे बट दिस फॉर्म द बेसिस ऑफ ॲक्च्युअल अनेक्सेशन ऑफ इंडियन किंगडम्स इन द नाईन्टीन सेंचुरी वी आर नाव इन द लेट एटीन सेंचुरी सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट द स्टेट्स एन्ड अप साईनिंग ऑल ऑफ दिस सो दे हॅव नो आर्मी दे हॅव द राजा इज नाव हिज रॉयल्टी इज प्रोटेक्टेड सो ही इज नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन गव्हर्नन्स ही विल नॉट स्पेंड ऑन पीपल ही विल स्पेंड ऑन इज ओन लक्झरीज देर इज लॉ अँड ऑर्डर इश्यूज अँटी सोशल एलिमेंट्स कम अप अँड द पीपल आर अँग्री सो एकंदरीत ह्या सगळ्याचा राजाला फायदा झाला ब्रिटिश ब्रिटिशांना प्रचंड फायदा झाला समाजाचं नुकसान झालं तो अशा प्रकारचा हा सबसिडी अलायन्सची आयडिया लॉर्ड वेलेसलीनी आणली होती नाव लेट्स गेट बॅक टू द मराठा सेव्हन्टीन एटी टूमध्ये मी म्हणालो होतो फर्स्ट अँग्लो मराठा वॉर झाली ट्वेंटी इयर्स नो वॉर सो द वॉर ऑज इट वॉट एव्हर वॉर मे हॅपन वॉज आफ्टर एटीन झिरो टू सबसिडरी अलायन्स वॉज प्रप प्रमलगेटेड बाय लॉर्ड वेलेसली आफ्टर सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी एट सो नाव इफ द ब्रिटिश हॅड अ वॉर विथ मराठाज दे कुड व्हेरी इझिली साईन सबसिडरी अलायन्स मग अठराशे दोनमध्ये मराठ्यांनी सबसिडरी अलायन्स साईन केला पण त्याच्या आधी म्हैसोर वॉज डिफिटेड इन सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी नाईन निजाम वॉज डिफिटेड इन द सेम टाईम सो ऑलरेडी मेनी किंगडम्स हॅड साईन सबसिडरी अलायन्स अँड द ओन्ली किंगडम रिमेनिंग मेजर किंगडम वॉज मराठाज सो नाव लेट्स गो टू वॉट ट्रान्सपायर्ड टू द सेकंड अँग्लो मराठा वॉर आपण सगळा बेस तयार केला आहे सालबेची ट्रीटी बघितली वीस वर्षाचं काय नाही करायचं आपण सबसिडरी अलायन्स बघितला आपण बघितलं लॉर्ड वेलेसले आता आलाय आता आपण लेट सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टीजच्या घटनांकडे जाऊयात ज्याच्यामुळे दुसरं ब्रिटिश आणि मराठ्यांचं युद्ध झालं सेकंड अँग्लो मराठा वॉर ऑफ एटीन झिरो टू नाव वॉट इज इट यू विल फाईंड दॅट द मराठाज लॉस ऑल केपेबल रुलर्स बाय एटीन हंड्रेड सो महाजी शिंदे द मेन पॅट्रियार्क ऑफ द सिंधियाज ऑफ गावलेर ही डाईड इन सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी फोर अहिल्याबाई होळकर द मेन मेट्रियार्क ऑफ द होळकर पीपल शी डाईड इन सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी फाईव्ह नाना साहेब नाना फेड फडनेस वॉज ॲक्च्युली डेफ्टली हँडलिंग ऑल द डिप्लॉमसी ही डाईड इन एटीन हंड्रेड अँड ऑल काइंड ऑफ इनेप्ट लिडर्स ऑल काइंड ऑफ पीपल विथ मायोपिक विजन्स दे स्टार्टेड टू रूल द मराठा कॉन्फिडरसी सो इन पुना माधवराव पेशवा द सेकंड डाईड इन सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी फाईव्ह अँड इन रिटर्न द वर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द पेशवास दॅट इज पेशवा बाजीराव द सेकंड The first Bajirao Peshwa was from 1720 to 1740. He was the one who conquered Delhi for, for the first time and he never lost any war. This is by Peshwa Bajirao II who came to rule in 1795. He is the most stupid and the most maniac leader of the Peshwas you will ever find. You will get to know why. The Holkars now got under the control of Yashwantara Holkar. He was a good military man but again a myopic person. He did not know where the interest of the Marathas lie. and similarly amongst the sindhias you have daulat rao sindhia coming to power so these three villains of maratha empire daulat rao shinde yashwant rao holkar and bajirao peshwa the second these three people single handedly screwed all the maratha empire 
he they single handedly screwed all the dreams of chatrapati shivaji to rule entire india we will get to see how what happened was that in 1802 the british were already fighting with the marathas especially the holkars so you have yashwantra holkar actually pinning the british down in delhi so the british were in red fort and they were totally surrounded by the armies of yashwantra holkar in that time when the british were about to be defeated this person daulat rao shinde attacked indore which is the uh, headquarters of holkar people so this was a rivalry between holkars and shindes and it was said that this was this attack was also had a tacit acceptance of the peshwa bajirao peshwa sitting in pune so now the holkars that is yashwantra holkar got extremely angry that how can shindes and the peshwas in pune plot against me so what he did was a destructive step in 1802 the holkar army invaded pune with the attack pune imagine that they attacked pune their own capital city of their entire empire they attacked pune and then naturally the aim was to attack the peshwa so what did bajirao peshwa the second do he committed yet another suicide so if dalotra shinde was bad uh, yashwantra holkar was worse bajirao peshwa the second was worst he did the unthinkable on 31st of december 1802 when he knew that pune is going to be sacked this idiot went to the british uh, at a fort called the wasai sa killa which we had seen at during the portuguese so he went to wasai which the british called it as basain he went to the british in their fort at basain and he ended up signing subsidiary alliance with the british so why so why because the british will protect the frontiers of the peshwa lands so that he will get protected from his own people holkars and shindes stupidity isn't it absolute plain stupidity it is nothing but suicide and the peshwa did it he signed the subsidiary alliance with the british in 1802 so now the british peshwas accepted british paramountcy they had a british resident in their court they had uh, uh, you will find that they had all kinds of british armies being posted and essentially they lost all independence and now they forced the uh, the british now having captured pune and essentially under subsidiary alliance now the british began to wage wars with holkars and shindes mind you when the maratha confederacy was won when holkar shindes gaikwads bhosles and the peshwas in pune together fought war they were invincible but the moment british began fighting wars with one one of them now their problems began to rise so when peshwa signed subsidiary alliance in 1802 the holkars and shindes refused to sign they said we will not sign the subsidiary alliance and they declared war against the british so these wars are essentially called as the second anglo maratha wars of 1802 so from 1802 to 1806 the holkars and the shindes and the baroda gaikwads of baroda fought wars with the british all lost to the british what a terrible fall of the great maratha empire they lost to the british and everybody ended up signing subsidiary alliance in by 1806 so imagine a small levde the tichuk bhar british and they brought the entire maratha empire to their feet why not because the british were strong chuk aplyat hai aplis lok ekmekan madhe bhandana lavta punyacha peshwa brahman holkar he dhangar hai ani shinde he shando koi hai bhandana kara ekmekan madhe jealousies ha majha virudha to tacha virudha to tacha virudha asa karun akha samrajya budavle and the british ultimately got hold of the maratha empire indirectly of course still the peshwas and the shindes and holkars were the kings but the british were now in the background now they had their armies in the maratha kingdom their residents were there in the uh, maratha courts imagine the interference so this is a, a pictorial representation of the treaty of uh, the war uh, that the british fought in multiple places so you will find he gurus ek prakar se and tacha aur british chadun chadhai karta hai अशा प्रकार युद्ध सभी झाली मराठा हारले व्हाट वॉज द ब्रिटी ऑफ बसाइन दैट द पेशवा एक्जैक्टली साइन ते पे जरा डिटेल मे बहुत अपन कारण हे कभी कभी प्रश्न पड़ता सो द पेशवा एक्सेप्टेड ब्रिटिश पैरामाउंसी सो द ब्रिटिश आर पैरामाउंट एंड पेशवाज आर सब्सिडियरी टू द ब्रिटिश आई टोल्ड यू अ ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट वॉज टू बी प्लेस्ड इन मराठा कोर्ट सो पेशवें कोर्ट मे एलफिन्स्टन नवाच एक मणूस आला जो ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट होता तो कुछ रहा महत्ति है आज पुण्यामध्ये मॉडर्न कॅफे तुम्ही बघितलंय मॉडर्न कॅफेच्या समोर पुण्याचं डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्ट आहे कोणी गेला असाल जर की महानगरपालिकेवरनं सरळ गेला तर मॉडर्न कॅफे येतं आणि त्याच्या समोरच्या बाजूला डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्ट आहे 
ते सगळी दगडी बिल्डिंग आहे त्याच्यावर वेल चढलेले दॅट इसेन्शली वॉज द रेसिडेन्स ऑफ दिस ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट एल्फिन्सन तिथे राहायचा सो मुळा मुठा ह्या बाजूला शनिवारवाडा पलीकडच्या बाजूला ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंटचं घर सो असा तो राहायचा सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट दिस ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट केम हिअर इन पुना अँड ही बिगॅन इंटरफिअरिंग इन द मराठा अफेअर्स सिक्स थाउजंड ट्रुप्स वर नाव पोस्टेड इन द लँड ऑफ द पेशवाज जिथे आधी या ब्रिटिशांची याची हिंमत व्हायची नाही तिथे आता सहा सहा हजार ब्रिटिश सैन्य आपल्याकडे आलेले पेशव्याची आत्ता परिस्थिती नाही पैसे द्यायची म्हणून त्यांनी जमीन देऊन टाकली ब्रिटिशांना की ह्या जमिनीवरनं रेव्हेन्यू कलेक्ट करा आणि तुमच्या आर्मीचे पैसे जे आहेत ते वळते करा सो तुंगभद्रा म्हणजे कर्नाटकचा भाग थोडासा आणि थोडे गुजरातमधले आणि तापी नदीच्या किनाऱ्याचे भाग हे सगळे भाग त्यांना देऊन टाकले घेऊन टाका मराठा जीवन सीडेड देअर चौथ राईट्स वर निजाम टेरिटरी कारण निजाम हैदराबादच्या आसपासची भरपूर टेरिटरीज मराठ्यांनी कब्जा केला होता त्याच्यावर मराठा चौथ लावायचे चौथ म्हणजे एक चौथाई वन फोर्थ सो तिकडच्या लोकांना वन फोर्थ ऑफ द इन्कम हॅड टू बी गिव्हन ॲज टॅक्स दॅट इज कॉल्ड चौथ सो निजामाच्या टेरिटरीजवर चौथ जी आहे ती त्यांनी तो अधिकार ब्रिटिशांना घेऊन टाकला मराठ्यांनी सांगितलं म्हणजे पेशव्यांनी सांगितलं की आम्ही कोणत्याही फ्रेंच आणि इतर लोकांचे आता संबंध ठेवणार नाही आणि निजाम आणि बडोद्याचे गायकवाड यांच्याशी जर काही चर्चा करायची असेल तर ती ब्रिटिशांच्या परमिशननी करा म्हणजे तुम्ही इसेन्शली ब्रिटिशांना स्वतःच्या डोक्यावर बसवलेला आहे आणि कशामुळे नॉट बिकॉज द ब्रिटिश डिफिटेड यू इन वॉर बट बिकॉज यू आर अन इनेप्ट पर्सन हू एंडेड अप डुईंग ऑल दॅट स्टार सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट दिस इज द पिक्चर वेअर द अँग्लो मराठा वॉर सेकंड अँग्लो मराठा वॉर एंडेड इन द ट्रीटी ऑफ बसाईन सो यू हॅव ऑन द लेफ्ट साईड द पेशवा पेशवा बाजीराव द सेकंड द मोस्ट नॉन सेन्सिकल पर्सन साईनिंग द ट्रीटी ऑफ बसाईन आता अठराशे दोन पासून आपण अठराशे अठरा ला येऊया नॅचरली द ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट वॉज देअर माउंट लॉर्ड एल्फिन्स्टन अँड दिस इडियट वॉज इंटरफिअरिंग विथ द अफेअर्स ऑफ द पेशवा नॅचरली द पेशवाज वर नॉट एट ऑल कम्फर्टेबल विथ इट बाजीराव द सेकंड रिअलाइज इज मिस्टेक दॅट नाव इट इज अ स्टुपिडिटी टू लेट द ब्रिटिश इन ब्रिटिश काय स्वतःच्या फायद्यासाठी येणार आहेत ते काय आपल्याला फायद्याचे नाही आणि आपल्याला आपलं स्वातंत्र्य परत मिळवलं पाहिजे म्हणून यांनी काय केलं द ब्रिटिश पीपल द द पेशवा अँड इज आर्मीज सिक्रेटली अलाइड विथ द होल्डकर्स अँड शिंदियास विच वॉज ऑफकोर्स गोईंग टू हॅपन अँड दे अटॅक्ट द ब्रिटिश रेसिडेंट इन पुणा सो त्या डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्टवाल्या जिथे तो राहायचा तिथे त्याच्यावर हल्ला झाला अँड दे डिक्लेअर्ड वॉर अगेन्स्ट द ब्रिटिश इट वॉज द पेनल्टिमेट फायनल वॉर विथ द ब्रिटिश की द बास झालं आता ब्रिटिशांचं सबसिडरी आला आहे आम्हाला मान्य नाही आता आम्ही त्यांना फेकून देणार बाय बट इट वॉज टू लेट द ब्रिटिश हॅड गॉट टू पॉवरफुल अँड ऑल वर डिफिटेड होल्डकर्स अँड सिंधियाज गॉट डिफिटेड दे परत त्यांची राज्य जी होती ती ठेवली गेली त्यांना राजा बनवलं गेलं पण त्यांना खूप प्रचंड प्रकारे त्यांना पॉवरलेस बनवण्यात आलं बाजीराव द सेकंड हा जो पेशवा आहे हा माणूस त्याला पुण्यातनं हाकलून दिलं गेलं अँड ही वॉज पेन्शन डॉफ की तुम्हाला ब्रिटिशांतर्फे पेन्शन मिळेल आणि कुठेतरी दूर जाऊन राहायचं परत पुण्यात यायचं नाही सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाईम द ब्रिटिश इतके टिचूकभर ब्रिटिश काही हजार त्यांनी अख्ख्या मराठा साम्राज्याला कन्क्लुझिव्हली डिफीट केलेलं आहे द मराठाज लॉस्ट फॉर एव्हर द ड्रीम ऑफ छत्रपती शिवाजी एज कम टू अँड एंड ना दिल्लीचं तख्त तुम्ही आता राखत नाहीत आणि विदाउट रादर सेईंग दॅट द द द मराठाज आर नाव नॉमिनल रुलर्स द ब्रिटिश अनेक्स्ट ऑल द मराठा टेरिटरीज एस्पेशली इन डेक्कन गुजरात अँड कर्नाटक रिजन थोडंसं तुम्ही शिंद्यांना त्यांनी दे अलाउड शिंद्यास टू कं टू कंटिन्यू विथ स्मॉल टेरिटरीज दे अलाउड होल्डकर्स टू कंटिन्यू विथ स्मॉल टेरिटरीज बट मेजॉरिटी ऑल द मेजर इन पार्ट्स ऑफ द मराठा एम्पायर आर नाव ऑफिशियली अनेक्स्ड बाय द ब्रिटिश एम्पायर जस्ट सी हाऊ पॉवरफुल दे बिकेम I told you the Mysore and the Nizams had already signed the subsidiary alliance in late 1790s. These two major kingdoms were. They were only the Maratha. The Maratha was the only kingdom that they had. So now the British are ruling in all parts of India. The only part left is the Punjab region where the Sikh people are powerful. Under Maharaja Ranjit Singh. The annexation of Punjab and Sindh will deal in the next lecture. But you will find that the Marathas are now conclusively defeated. and the british have defeated the most powerful kingdom in india and their way of british conquest to india is now free mukul ran me ala kan mothi kingdom is defeat jali ta ta bharatyan kade power as nahi hai british ancha viroda kahi hi karaycha so this is called as the pencil sketch of surrender of peshwa so ha jo manus ubha hai to peshwa he is coming and surrendering in front of the british bajirao the second 
he is surrendering and all the maratha territories are now annexed by the british why marathas lost i ya atta pan ja gosti bolle ta fakt facts hote analysis far mahatvach hai why did the marathas lose marathans actually lost ka jala by the way if you have any other questions keep on typing so i'll answer those questions why did the marathas lose hecha analysis karna far garje cha not always that their enemies were strong but internal problems existed so i told the first point is defect in the maratha state even if the maratha empire ruled all parts of india it was not a uniform empire it was a confederacy uh, chhatrapati sat, uh, sat in satara he was a nominal ruler the real ruler was the peshwa sitting in pune he had bartered off all the major maratha territories to small small sardars so the barodas of gaikwad bosles of nagpur holkars of indore and shindes of gwalior these people essentially ruled and they were for our practical purposes independent rulers but they somehow you know coordinated with the peshwa sitting in pune so the maratha state was not a uniform state it was a confederacy multiple sardars essentially coordinated with each other not because it was a uniform state that so that coordination hoyche theek hai but there was so much of jealousy around so much of issues around that these people simply could not function well so i told you sindhyas versus holkars holkars versus peshwas nalayak pana jhala sara ya nalayak pana la dusra nalayak pana jhala nalayak nete mele with davlat rao sindhya yashwant rao holkar as well as peshwa bajirao the second they simply could not gauge the british intentions ki ba tumhala ya lokana tumhala barbad karaycha hai tumhi kay bhanta ekmekan mane but tanna te lakshat ala nahi and the british finally took over the maratha kingdoms the third reason weak revenue structure हे भरपूर लोक बोलत नाही पण युद्ध जर तुम्हाला करायचं आहे ना किंवा मोठं साम्राज्य चालवायचं आहे तर पैसे लागतात मग मी तुम्हाला म्हटलं तुम्हाला सोल्जर्सला तुम्हाला पैसे द्यायला लागतात घोडे ढाल तलवारी सगळ्यासाठी पैसे लागतात रेनोव्हेशन करायला लागतं तुम्हाला त्यांना परत धार द्यायला लागते लोखंड विकत घ्यायला लागतं या सगळ्यासाठी सो मेंटेनिंग अँड आर्मी इज अ बिग मिलिटरी इश्यू रेव्हेन्यू इश्यू सो तुमच्या राज्याचं जोवर रेव्हेन्यू स्ट्रक्चर खूप स्ट्रॉंग नाही आहे तुमच्याकडे जोवर भरपूर पैसे नाही आहेत तोवर तुम्हाला एवढी मोठी आर्मी सस्टेन करता येते मराठ्यांचा इश्यू काय झाला आपला जो कोर एरिया आहे दख्खनचा प्रांत हा सगळा शुष्क प्रांत आहे आपल्याकडे काही शेती फार प्रगत नाही त्यावेळी काही पवार साहेब नव्हते मोठी मोठी धरणं बांधायला त्याच्यामुळे आपल्याकडे उसाची काही शेती व्हायची नाही त्यामुळे आपल्याकडे ज्वारीबाजरीची शेती कोरडभाऊ शेती त्यामुळे त्याच्यातनं रेव्हेन्यू निघणार तरी काय तुम्ही नॉर्थचे सगळे भाग जे पॉन्कर केले होते तिकडनं तुम्ही लोकांकडनं चौथ उकाळायचा एक चौथाही तुम्ही त्यांच्याकडनं रेव्हेन्यू घ्यायचा पण तिथे सुद्धा तुम्ही फुल फोर्सफुली घ्यायचं फोर्सफुली तुम्ही घेतल्यामुळे तिकडनं सुद्धा पैसा कमी यायचा त्यामुळे प्रॉब्लेम असं झाला की तुमच्या अख्ख्या साम्राज्याकडे पैसाच नाही यू हॅव नो मनी हाऊ टू हाऊ डू यू सस्टेन विदाऊट मनी सो ह्या एन्टायर प्रॉप रेव्हेन्यू स्ट्रक्चरमुळे यू कुड नॉट सस्टेन ब्रिटिश ऑन दी अदर हँड हॅड स्मॉल टेरिटरीज बट रिच टेरिटरीज ॲट दी एंड ऑफ द डे बेंगॉल इज अ रिच टेरिटरी बस त्यावेळीचं बंगाल म्हणजे बंगाल आसाम बिहार ओरिसा हा भाग हे सगळे भागातनं जे रेव्हेन्यू यायचे ते किती चांगले यायचे कारण सुपीक भाग आहे तिथे जी काही शेती होईल तिकडनं भरपूर रेव्हेन्यू उकळता यायचा त्यांच्याकडे ट्रेड चालू होती त्यांच्याकडे कॉटन टेक्सटाईल्स बनत होत्या ब्रिटिश ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी युज टू ट्रेड तर नॅचरली ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी हॅड अ मच बेगर बेटर मनी सोर्सेस दॅन द मराठा एम्पायर द नेक्स्ट पॉईंट इज इनएफिशियंट आर्मी आता मराठा साम्राज्याची आर्मी कशी असायची मेन मराठी माणसं त्याच्यात होती नक्कीच पण दे हॅड अ लॉट ऑफ मर्सिनरीज इन दॅम सो पिंडारी हे नाव ऐकलं असेल की त्यांना फक्त पैसे द्यायचे ते पुढे जाऊन सगळं बर्बाद करून देणार मागणं मराठा सैन्य येणार आणि सगळं कॅप्चर करणार सो असं सगळं इनएफिशियंट स्ट्रक्चर होतं त्यात सुद्धा देर वर लॉट ऑफ मर्सिनरीज वॉट आर मर्सिनरीज दे फाईट फॉर मनी सो तू मला जर दहा रुपये देशील तुझ्या बाजून लढायला तर तुझ्या बाजून लढेल पण तुझ्या शत्रूने मला जर पन्नास रुपये देतील मी त्याच्या बाजूने लढेल सो मर्सिनरी हॅज नो लॉयल्टी ही जस्ट फाईट्स फॉर मनी सो द मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द पेशवाज आर्मीज for essentially mercenaries who used to fight for money and that is the reason why you will find that the army was inefficient from technology perspective you will find that the british were far better aligned in their technologies rather than the marathas marathan kade ek artillery division hoti pan tacha kay far kadi vapar kela gela nahi you did not uh, uh, renovate or modernize your military as compared to the british बिकॉज त्यांच्याकडे स्नायपर गन्सारखा प्रकार होता मिलिटरी त्यांची चांगली होती ट्रेंड होती कॅव्हलरी चांगली होती त्यांच्याकडे तोफा चांगल्या होत्या आपल्याकडे ते थोडंसं कमी पडले सो इवन इफ यू हॅड टू फाईट वॉर्स अँड यू आर हॅव्हिंग लार्ज मिलिटरी बाय नंबर 
you could not fight a war with the british who were far better in their military structure than you so uh, it was always a problem for you lack of credible allies so now this is one of the major issue maratha kingdom was there but the marathas could never forge good alliances with the rajputs or the jats or the sikhs je kay karan ase thode chuka apla kadna pan jhalya thode chuka tancha kadna pan jhalya ti loko pan swarthi hoti tanna pan swatah chi satta thevayachi hoti ani tyamule british jar marathancha virudhat ladta ait ani paraspar marathana defeat karta ait ta amcha fayda asa mhanun bharpur lokani support nahi kela chuk marathan kadna pan hoti paise jasto ukalayche mhanun ya sagya rajyana pehlo hota bharpur tancha kadna revenue demand jhala hota so you will find that in all these cases marathas essentially ended up with no allies so uh, the indian kingdoms did not choose to ally with the marathas major problem hai ani tyamule tumhala support kutna mila nahi pani pachcha bhai pan tez jhalo hota by the way so we refuse to learn from our own mistakes so the marathas had no credible allies and the last and the major is no skillful diplomacy leading to blunders so uh, nana fadnis over hote 1795 parent he was jailed and he mm-hmm. died in 1800 so uh, the time when this man was there he was still at least you no know, deftly managing the diplomatic affairs peshwa bajirao the second had no brains directly jaun tumhi subsidiary alliance sign karun alat man antar jeva kala ki british ana doizard hota hai tema tumhi yuddha karala gela tema kai jala nahi so even the british accept so there is a british uh, person called colonel palmer mm-hmm. he himself accepted that uh, uh, the entire uh, wisdom of the maratha empire went away with the death of nana fadnis so once nana fadnis died the maratha empire lost its brains and they simply could not do any diplomacy properly and they lost the british on the other hand were very smart people tancha mulat existences india mare skillful diplomacy mule ala hota tanna kasa konala kuthe chuna lavaycha he mahit hota tyamule he chune lavna je ahe he marathana kay jamla nahi tyanantar and they lost so ha analysis far mahatvacha hai ki why marathas lost so if you if i if i just look at all these points you will realize ki we lost because of our own problems rather than the british being powerful had the marathas really been united and you know decided to screw the british forget british not a single european power could have set foot in india but amite karu nahi shaklo ha mala motha problem jhala tyama ya sagyatna shevti evda motha samrajya ubharla अटक पास कटक पर्यत साम्राज्य होता सग साम्राज्य खलास दिल्ली का अपन एकेका तख्त राखाचो पो तख्त अपने हाथ में निसटला एक सग हाथ में निसटला शेवटी तो ब्रिटिशां हाथी गला सो द मराठाज लॉस्ट सो फ्रॉम हिस्ट्री पर्स्पेक्टिव वॉट यू शूड बी नोइंग इज द फर्स्ट एंग्लो मराठा वॉर एंड वॉट इज द ट्रीटी ऑफ सालबे यू शूड बी नोइंग वॉट इज सब्सिडरी अलायंस एंड यू शूड बी नोइंग द सेकेंड एंग्लो मराठा वॉर एंड हाउ द पेशवा इंडेड ऑफ साइनिंग ट्रीटी ऑफ बसाइन and you should be doing the third anglo maratha war and the fifth is the reasons of the loss of marathas sadharanta ha aspect kalavar maratha samrajya kasa dhuis mial he tumhala lakshat hai okay this was about the maratha wars uh, please post your questions if you have something i'll try to answer them uh, we'll now essentially shift to mysore wars so i told you apart from the marathas it was mysore kingdom under hyder ali and tipu sultan which were bigger uh, which was a substantially big kingdom so the british tried to fight wars with the marathas uh, with the mysore people if they fought two wars three wars with the marathas they fought four wars with the mysore people so mysore madhe sadharan panipat cha yuddha jema jala 1761 nantar marathas lost control they were their entire focus was in north india so tacha fayda ghun uh, mysore chi wadeyar ji dynasty ahe त्यांना बाजूला सारलं आणि हैदर अली नावाचा माणूस ह्यांनी म्हैसूरवर सत्ता स्थापन केली सो हिज बिगॅन टू कंट्रोल म्हैसूर विथ इट्स कॅपिटल ॲट श्रीरंगपटना इट इज देअर ऑन दी बँक्स ऑफ दी कावेरी सो श्रीरंगपटना वॉज द कॅपिटल ऑफ द म्हैसूर किंगडम अँड दे स्टार्टेड टू रूल इन दिस एंटायर सदन कर्नाटक अँड थोडासा तमिळनाड कुर्ग त्रावणकोर भागामध्ये यांचं राज्य चालू झालं सो नॅचरली दे वर ऑल्सो बिग प्रॉब्लेम फॉर द ब्रिटिश अँड द ब्रिटिश वॉन्टेड टू डिफीट द म्हैसूर किंगडम इन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट सो नाव लेट्स गेट बॅक आता मग अठराशे अठरापर्यंत पोचलो होतो नाव अगेन लेट्स गेट बॅक टू सिक्सटीन सेवन्टीज कारण हे सगळं पॅरलली घडतंय सो नाव वी आर इन सिक्सटीन सेवन्टीन सिक्स्टी सेवन सिक्स्टी नाईन सो यू हॅव रॉबर्ट क्लाईव्ह देअर अँड रॉबर्ट क्लाईव्ह इज नाव ट्राईंग टू वेज वॉर अगेन्स्ट द मैसोर किंगडम इट वॉज विथ अंडर हैदर अली ॲट दॅट पॉईंट ऑफ टाईम द ब्रिटिश अँड हैदर अली फॉट ॲट अ प्लेस कॉल्ड पोर्टो नोवो अँड मड्रास सो पोर्टो नोवो इज अ पोर्ट ऑन द नियर पॉंडिचेरी अँड मड्रास 
these places where the first anglo mysore conflict took place but at that point of time the british had not done any skillful diplomacy so the marathas and the nizam the two major kingdoms they threw their weight behind mysore so they supported mysore so ata ek akki motha maratha samrajya nizam which is also a substantially big kingdom and mysore are now collectively fighting against the british because yave nana fadnis hota to he knew ki apnele britishanche virudhat ladhayche so you will find that the british lose so the british were caught by surprise and a humiliating treaty was signed and the british had to restore all the major uh, lands that had captured from mysore so the first anglo mysore war led to much more financial ruin of the east india company because already ya kaar 69 made uh, bengal made famine chalu hota robert clive was looting bengal and tyat tumhi evda paisa kharcha karu nahi tumhala kahich jhala nahi mysore yuddhat na kahich jhala nahi so the economic ruin of east india company starts from this time the second war 1780 to 1784 so now again warren hastings has come to india now 1772 nantar chi goshta hai Uh, 1780 to 84 मध्ये फर्स्ट अँग्लो मराठा वॉर झाली 82 मध्ये आणि साइड बाय साइड म्हैसूर बरोबर पण युद्ध चालू तो हैदर अली वर तो हल्ला करतो येट अगेन मराठाज अँड निजाम कम ऑन द साइड ऑफ हैदर अली हैदर अली डाइज इन 1781 82 अँड ही इज नाउ टेकन ओव्हर बाय हिज सन टिपू सुलतान सो ही जी सेकंड अँग्लो मराठा अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर आहे त्याच्यात इसेंशियली द रोल ऑफ टिपू सुलतान इज व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट ही अलाइज विथ द मराठाज अँड द निजाम अँड द ब्रिटिश आर अगेन कन्क्लुझिवली डिफिटेड Uh, at Por- uh, Porto Novo and other surrounding regions and a treaty of Mangalore is signed thode shak territories je ahet tya Mysore cha british ana denat alya but mahatvashi Mysore cha territories were retained by Tipu Sultan 1782 madhe Maratha signed the treaty of Salve and say that for 20 years we will not have a war with british and we will support the british venture against Mysore so ata second war paryanta to Marathas ekatra hote ya pude je yuddha hotil त्या सगळ्या युद्धांमध्ये आता मात्र मराठा ब्रिटिशांच्या बाजूने लढणार आहे सो ॲज आय टोल यू अवर डिप्लॉमसी ऑलवेज मेनी अ टाइम स्क्रूज अप सो आपली डिप्लॉमसी स्क्रू अप झाली आणि या सगळ्यामध्ये आता मराठाज आर नाव इन द थर्ड अँग्लो मैसूर वॉर दे आर अगेन्स्ट द मराठाज अगेन्स्ट द मैसूर पीपल सो लक्षात ठेवायला सोपं आहे चार युद्ध झाली पहिल्या दोनमध्ये मराठा एकत्र मैसूर बरोबर नंतरच्या दोन युद्धामध्ये मैसूरच्या विरोध असंच लक्षात ठेवा सो पहिली दोन युद्ध ब्रिटिशांच्या बिलकुल फेवरमध्ये गेली नाही कारण मराठा मैसूरच्या बाजूने लढत होते पहिल्या युद्धात पूर्णपणे डिफीट झाले दुसऱ्या युद्धात ट्रेटी ऑफ मँगलोअर साईन झाली सेव्हन्टीन एटी फोरची त्यामध्ये थोड्याशा काही टेरिटरीज ज्या आहेत त्या टिपू सुलतांनी देऊन टाकल्या पण आता ब्रिटिश आर स्टील नॉट एबल टू कॅप्चर मैसूर नाव टिपू सुलतान सेस दॅट ह्या सगळ्यामध्ये आय विल स्क्रू द ब्रिटिश कम वॉट मे स्क्रू यू ऑल नाव मला लक्षात आलं की ब्रिटिश जे आहेत दे आर माझ्यावर टकलेले आहेत सो ना आय विल स्क्रू हिम स्क्रू द ब्रिटिश सो वॉट डिड टिपू सुलतान डू दिस इज इसेन्शली टिपू सुलतान आय एम सॉरी इट इज इसेन्शली हैदर अली मीटिंग विथ द ब्रिटिश पीपल बिफोर द थर्ड वॉर व्हॉट इसेन्शली टिपू सुलतान ट्राय टू डू वॉज टिपू सुलतान स्टार्टेड टू मॉडर्नाइज इज आर्मी तो त्यांनी एक मॉडर्न आर्मी बनवायचा प्रयत्न केला ही ब्रॉड स्नायपर्स इन इज आर्मी की जे गन पावडरने स्नाईप करून लोकांना मारू शकतील he brought french people to train his people in army so french barobar sudha to ta jawal yayla lagla he uh, ensured that all the british east india trade that happened through the ports of kerala region which were under tipu sultan's control they were banned british east india company was banned from uh, exporting anything from there he ensured that no sale of pepper or any spices goes to the british so to essentially british anna squeeze karal lagla manus but of course that was not enough Marathas went away from the Mysore kingdom because you will have him him signing the uh, the treaty of Salve Marathas are supporting the british now Nizam ala sudha british ani bribe kela ki chal tula Guntur bhagatle thode she regions tumhala deun takto jar Mysore capture jhala tar thode she tumhala deun takao ami ase manun Nizam ala sudha british ani aplya bazuni walavle Travancore ani Kurg se je raja hote manje Keral se essentially they were already troubled by Tipu Sultan because Tipu Sultan was a islamic fanatic he had killed a lot of hindus destroyed a lot of temples in that region so naturally those were also in no mood to support tipu sultan so ata tipu sultan viruddha british maratha nizam taravankor kurg sagles tipu sultan var ale ani third anglo mysore war zalo 1789 to 1792 yamadhe matra tipu sultan 
डिफीट झाला पण कसं तरी नाना फडणवीस होता तर कसं तरी डिप्लॉमसी करून ही इन्शोर डेट कसं तरी म्हैसूर सर्वाईव्ह होईल बट म्हैसूर हॅड टू पे अ ह्यूज मनी फॉर गेटिंग इट्स टेरिटरीज बॅक अँड इट लॉस्ट ऑलमोस्ट हाफ ऑफ इट्स टेरिटरीज सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट मल्टिपल प्रॉब्लेम्स म्हैसूर नाव स्टार्टेड टू फेस बाय सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी नाईन द मराठाज दॅमसेल्स वर वीक टिपू नाना फडणवीस वॉज नॉट देअर बाजीराव द सेकंड वॉज देअर ते डी नॉट रिअलाईज द इम्पॉर्टन्स ऑफ सपोर्टिंग टिपू सुलतान इन इस किंगडम सो नाव वॉट द ब्रिटिश डेड वॉज ते सस द आर लॉर्ड वेलेसले इसेन्शली ही सस्पेक्टेड दॅट टिपू सुलतान इज प्लॉटिंग अगेन्स्ट इम बाय एन्शुरिंग मराठाज अँड निझाम ऑल केम ऑन हिस साईड सो द ब्रिटिश प्री एम्प्टिंग एनी अटॅक ऑन टिपू सुल बाय टिपू सुलतान द ब्रिटिश दॅमसेल्स अटॅक श्रीरंगपट्टण the capital of tipu sultan this is the fourth and the last anglo mysore war and this time the british stormed and sirangapatnam they killed tipu sultan and they totally uh, uh, got hold of mysore kingdom but i told you the british was still not in mood of annexing kingdoms so what they did was they asked this man uh, uh, the bodiyar dynasty which was earlier ruling mysore before hyder ali they were put on throne again and that man that king odiar king was forced to sign subsidiary alliance so he signed a subsidiary alliance with the british so again this kingdom came under the control of british so nizams and awadh and mysore all three came under subsidiary alliance in 17 late 1790s and in 1802 the peshwa signed subsidiary alliance by the treaty of basain so this is how anglo mysore wars happened so i guess i have a map uh, this is uh, the photo of ब्रिटिश आर्मी स्टॉर्मिंग श्रीरंगपट्टण ते गुरुज दिसत आहेत तुम्हाला त्याच्यावर स्टॉर्म करून चढून बर्बाद करून तुम्हाला ब्रिटिश श्रीरंगपट्टणममध्ये घुसताना जे दिसत आहे हा दिस इज द मॅप दॅव टॉकिंग अबाउट सो लेफ्टचा मॅप आहे दिस इज द सिच्युएशन आफ्टर सेकंड अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर सेकंड अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर नंतर म्हैसूरची किंगडम आहे ती थोडीफार कशी बशी तरी वाचली गेली थोडीफार लेफ्ट राईट साईडला थर्ड अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर नंतर तुम्हाला दिसेल म्हैसूरच्या आसपास थोडेसे चेक्समध्ये टेरिटरीज ब्लर केलेले आहेत दॅट इज द टेरिटरी टिपू सुलतान लॉस्ट अंडर थर्ड अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर अँड अंडर फोर्थ अँग्लो म्हैसूर वॉर हे आसपासचे सगळे रिजन्स ब्रिटिशांनी कागदीच केले तो निळा भाग दाखवला तो गुंटूरचा भाग तो निजामाला देऊन टाकला आसपासचे भाग त्यांनी स्वतःकडे ठेवले आणि जे मध्ये राहिलं तेच छोटंसं म्हैसूर राहिलं आणि त्यात सुद्धा वडेयार डायनेस्टीला बसवलं आणि त्यांना सबसिडरी अलायन्स साईन करायला लावला सो अशा प्रकारे द ब्रिटिश गॉट होल्ड ऑफ द म्हैसोर किंगडम सो यू विल फाईंड दॅट द ब्रिटिश फॉट विथ द मराठास फर्स्ट अँड सेकंड अँड थर्ड अँग्लो मराठा वॉर दे फॉट विथ द द म्हैसोर पीपल द फोर अँग्लो म्हैसोर वॉर्स दे ब्रॉट इन सबसिडरी अलायन्स अँड दे जस्ट एन्शुअर दॅट ऑल द ब्रिटिश पोझेशन्स that they have are indirect ones they are not directly annexing it and indirectly subsidiary alliance ni te tanchavar rule karnar manje kadhi tari in the future in 1830s 40s 50s they can permanently annex these kingdoms and make them part of official british empire ta asha prakar che sabhi intrigues je ahet he british ani 18 ve shatakamade kela you will find that uh, the british were in a very bad economic position in 1780s and 90s but soon after when they captured the maratha kingdoms naturally their economic conditions began to improve you will find that they brought something called as a permanent settlement in 1793 in the bengal region they brought uh, the uh, the uh, rayatwari settlement in the madras and the bombay region they pan apan kadhi purcha lectures mane kadhi tari baghnar ho so you will find that slowly slowly the british are getting very very powerful in this time and once they are getting more and more powerful now it is impossible for the british to stop तो ह्याच्यावर एक ॲनालिटिकल प्रश्न असा येऊ शकतो हा नेहमी विचारला जातो द ब्रिटिश कॉन्क्वेस्ट ऑफ इंडिया वॉज इट ॲक्सिडेंट और वॉज इट वेल प्लॅन हा प्रश्न नक्की येतो आणि दोन्ही बाजूनी कारण आर्ग्युमेंट्स आहेत ॲक्सिडेंट म्हणायचं झाला तर कारण इसेन्शली ब्रिटिश वर ट्रेडर्स दे हॅड नो इंटेन्शन ऑफ कॅप्चरिंग अ किंगडम त्यांचं मत हे होतं की आम्हाला आमचं ट्रेड जमला पाहिजे वी वॉन्ट अवर ट्रेड टू फ्लरिश इफ पॉलिटिकल कंट्रोल मेक्स दॅट ट्रेड टू फ्लरिश इवन मोर देन वी विल स्टार्ट कॅप्चरिंग so it was accident they, they did not sail from great britain to india with a view that we want an empire ultimately east india company was a private company last lecture when apan bagitla that east india company is essentially a shareholding joint stock company their aim was to gain profit pay their shareholders their dividends and pocket all the rest of the money hey tancha hai tu hota so he argument barobar hai ki they were merely traders they had not planned to come to india 
therefore then political control was only a means to just facilitate trade manje koni amcha trade la virodh karnar nahi you will find that pitch india act forbade the british from going to any war apan bagitla pitch india act madhe so again that can be used as an argument that the east india company and british parliament in general were under no means to go to a war why they were actually asking east india company to stop a war because they were not able to win tachani ulta tumches paise khalas hota so ya sagya madhe प्रॉब्लेम्स जे सगे एकत्र कर कशा सा वॉर करता हे ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी और ब्रिटिश पार्लिमेंट एक हेतु होते सो यू विल फाइंड दैट ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी वॉज नॉट इन अ वे टू यू नो अनेक्स किंगडम्स क्या सब्सिडरी अलायंस पता वॉरन हेस्टिंग्स ने सुधा बफर स्टेट्स क्रिएट के लिए लॉर्ड वेलसले ने सब्सिडरी अलायंस के एंड ही प्रिपेर जस्ट इनडायरेक्ट ब्रिटिश रूल इन इंडिया बट डिड नॉट एनेक्स टेरिटरीज सो हा आर्ग्युमेंट्स दिल जाऊ शकत टू से दैट इट वॉज जस्ट एन ऐक्सिडेंट ब्रिटिशांना दे टेस्टेड ब्लड वन्स दे गेट टू नो दॅट पॉलिटिकल कंट्रोलने अजून फायदा होतो आहे म्हणून जशी जशी टेरिटरीज त्यांच्या हातात लागत गेले तसे तसे ते एम्पायर बांधत गेले बट दे वर दे वर दे आर नॉट प्लॅन्ड इट ऑन द अदर साईड जेव्हा आर्ग्युमेंट दिली जाते की हे एक वेल प्लॅन्ड स्ट्रॅटेजी आहे ते का असं म्हटलं जातं तर एकंदरीत नो एम्पायर कॅन एव्हर नो ट्रेड पॉलिसी कॅन एव्हर फ्लरिश विदाऊट पॉलिटिकल कंट्रोल सो तुम्हाला पॉलिटिकल कंट्रोल बाय डिफॉल्ट पाहिजेच यू लुक ॲट एनी अदर कॉलोनायझिंग पॉवर पॉर्च्युगीजनी आफ्रिकेमध्ये किंवा सगळं कॉलोनाईज केलं पॉलिटिकल पॉवर त्यांनी मिळवलंच स्पॅनिश लोकांनी साऊथ अमेरिका नॉर्थ अमेरिकामध्ये रिसोर्सेस मिळवायला शेवटी तिकडच्या किंगडम्स बर्बाद करून स्वतःच्या अधिपत्याखाली किंगडम्स आणल्या त्यांनी सो आफ्रिका साऊथ अमेरिका एशिया साऊथ ईस्ट एशिया जनरली द कॉलोनियल पॉवर्स आर बिहाइंड अनेक्सिंग टेरिटरी बिकॉज अनेक्सिंग टेरिटरी इज द ओनली वे इन एन्शुरिंग यू कॅन लूट दॅट टेरिटरी अँड गेन मोर प्रॉफिट्स सो अशी आर्ग्युमेंट दिली जाते दॅट इफ द ब्रिटिश आर अनेक्सिंग टेरिटरी it is by default a well planned strategy and not something which is uh, by accident you see lord wellesley's own statement je mi tumhala manalo subsidiary alliance is a way of fattening allies just like we fatten pigs before slaughter so it was just a way to gain access to indian territories manje future madhe amhala te kabis karta hai so it was a plan magashi me lord hastings and lord minto cha ullekh kela hota tya lord minto ji statement hai that Um, our aim is to ensure that the british power is paramount in india in effect if not directly so so a pratyaksha rite aso de pan ami paramount honar india madhe ha amcha aim hai so you will find that how how british lok je ahet they started to annex indian territories in the first half of 19th century 1857 paryant so this was another reason why you can say that it was essentially a well planned strategy azun ek argument dili jate दॅट ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनीला चार्टर कोणाकडनं मिळाला होता किंग ऑफ इंग्लंड राईट सो इफ ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी इज गेटिंग अ चार्टर टू ट्रेड द किंग ऑल्सो शूड गेट समथिंग इन रिटर्न सो इट इज सेट दॅट द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी वॉज फुलफिलिंग द इम्पिरियल अँबिशन ऑफ द किंग सो तुम्ही राजाच्या बिहाफमध्ये ती टेरिटरीज काबीज करत होता सो राजा सांगणारच तुम्हाला की ते टेरिटरीज काबीज करा म्हणूनच रेग्युलेटिंग ऍक्ट ऑफ सेव्हन्टीन सेव्हन्टी थ्री ऑर फिट्स इंडिया ऍक्ट ऑफ सेव्हन्टीन एटी फोर put the entire british east india company dominions under the control of the british kingdom current te tancha kanda tene ghun takle why because you had ambitions to build an empire so it was a well planned strategy not because it was accidental so he arguments ekandarit sagya bazuni kele jau shakta ta ha pani kadhis paras wala prashna yeto that did the british capture india by accident or by a well planned strategy ala ek prashna disto hai that uh, if the french helped tibu set up an army why didn't they take part in the war प्रॉब्लेम असा आहे की ह्या वेळेस फ्रेन फ्रान्समध्ये ना फ्रेंच रेव्होल्युशन चालू होतं सेव्हन्टीन एटी नाईन फ्रेंच द बेस्टील वॉज स्टॉर्म्ड ऑन फोर्टीन्थ ऑफ जुलै सेव्हन्टीन एटी नाईन टिपू सुलतान टूक पॉवर इन सेव्हन्टीन एटी टू सो ह्या सगळ्या टाईममध्ये लुई द सिक्स्टीन्थ जो होता ही वॉज मॅसिव्हली अनपॉप्युलर थोडेफार त्यांचे इम्पिरियल अँबिशन जगभरात चालू होते बट फ्रान्स गॉट कन्झ्युम्ड इन इट्स इंटरनल अफेअर्स व्हेरी फास्ट तुम्ही बघितलं असेल सेव्हन्टीन एटी नाईनमध्ये फ्रेंच रेव्होल्युशन झाल्यावर फ्रान्स प्लंज इन टू अ सिव्हिल वॉर ते त्या सगळ्या रेव्होल्युशनरीजनी ते टूक होल्ड ऑफ द फ्रेंच थर्ड स्टेट त्यांनी फ्रेंच कॉन्स्टिट्युट असेंब्ली सेटअप केली सगळं केलं बट दे कुड नॉट ब्रिंग अ गुड कॉन्स्टिट्युशन ज्यामुळे सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी थ्रीमध्ये द फ्रेंच मोनार्क वॉज असॅसिनेटेड आणि त्यानंतर रोबेस्क्यूचा एक टेरर रेजीम आली शंभर दिवसांची त्यानंतर परत टर्मॉईल झाला देन द केम द रूल ऑफ डिरेक्टरी टील सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टी देन अगेन टर्मॉईल झाला आणि मग नेपोलियन केम टू पॉवर एज अ मोनार्क ऑफ फ्रान्स त्यानंतर फ्रान्स कुठे थोडा थोडा स्टेबिलाईज झाला टील एटीन हंड्रेड फिफ्टीन वेन नेपोलियन वॉज डेफिनेटेड सो सेव्हन्टीन एटीज अँड सेव्हन्टीन नाईन्टीज फ्रान्स इवन इफ इट वॉन्टेड टू हॅव टू प्ले अ व्हेरी बिग रोल इन दिस एन्टायर 
एशियन रिजन त्यांचे इंटरनल अफेअर्स एवढे बोंबललेले होते की ते काही करू शकले नाही सो फ्रान्स कुड नॉट पार्टिसिपेट द लास्ट टाइम फ्रान्स रिअली पार्टिसिपेटेड इन सम आर्मी वॉज इन द अमेरिकन लिबरेशन आय टोल यू सेव्हन्टीन सेव्हन्टी सिक्समध्ये अमेरिकन्स डिक्लेअर्ड इंडिपेंडन्स सेव्हन्टीन एटी वनमध्ये अमेरिका वॉज फ्री दे फॉट अगेन्स्ट द ब्रिटिश बट इट इज ब्रिटिश इट इज फ्रेंच मिलिटरी अँड नेव्ही विथ सपोर्टेड द अमेरिकन्स टू फाईट अगेन्स्ट द ब्रिटिश सो लफायत नावाचा त्यांचा एक मिलिटरी कमांडर होता जो सपोर्ट केला होता त्यांनी सेव्हन्टीन एटीज पर्यंत पण त्याचा परिणाम फ्रेंच इकॉनॉमीवर झाला कारण फ्रान्सचे पैसे खूप खर्च झाले त्यामुळे सेव्हन्टीन एटीज नंतर तुम्हाला सापडेल जनरली फ्रान्स डिड नॉट इन्वॉल्व इट्सेल्फ इन एनी मेजर वॉर एनिवेअर इन द वर्ल्ड दॅट्स वाय फ्रान्स डिड नॉट पार्टिसिपेट 